I'm Madeline Ferragino. I'm the um, Director of Government Relations here at Americans for Peace Now. Um, and we have a few housekeeping notes I just want to flag before we actually jump into the content. Um, and forgive me, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Um, so um, luckily, Sarit has quite a lot, um, or maybe not luckily, um, quite a lot of material to share with us today. Um, so yes, this webinar, just so you all know, is going to be recorded. Um, we will be using the Q&A button, not the chat. So make sure to press that Q&A button to type your question in. I'll read it from there because I will be reading it out loud. Um, please try to keep it pretty concise. Um, and we will be doing all those questions kind of toward the end. But right now, um, you know, I'm going to kick it off to, to Suri, uh, who is the international advocacy lead for B'Tselem. Um, and she's here to discuss the humanitarian disaster zone of the current Israel-Gaza war, as well as some of the recent reports they've produced at B'Tselem. Welcome, Suri. Um, you know, I think when we initially conceived of this webinar, even just, you know, last week when we were talking about it, um, the world unfortunately has shifted yet again. Um, you know, we're in a, it's hard to say even more tense moment as the last 11 plus months have been incredibly tense. But um, before we kind of get into the content of the reports, Sri, if, you know, how, one, how are you doing? Um, and if you want to talk a little bit about what it's like for you right now. Yeah. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for, for having me on and for the opportunity to talk about both uh, B'Tselem's work and our, you know, position in this uh, day and age, and also about this specific report, which we've invested a lot of effort in trying to publicize because we view it as one of the crucial um, things we have done over the past year. And it's really quite incredible to to think about the fact that a year has passed since the horrors of October 7th. So really thank you for this opportunity. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is that I'd like to address what is going on right now in the north of Israel and in Lebanon. Although B'Tselem doesn't focus our work on Lebanon, we don't do research on Lebanon, we're focused on the occupied Palestinian territories and, 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 and on the situation between the river and the sea that does not include Lebanon. But I think it really should be said that what we're seeing now could have been entirely avoided or largely avoided um, had the Israeli government accepted the possibility um, of reaching a ceasefire uh, with, uh, in Gaza that would involve a hostage deal as well. So returning the 101 Israeli hostages that have been uh, you know, in tunnels in Gaza in horrific conditions for almost a year, ending the, the mass violence, the mass killing of Palestinians in Gaza, and then also uh, the, the possibility of, uh, of avoiding what we are seeing now in the north of Israel and in Lebanon, which is also a shocking, um, just, uh, scary and very, very brutal um, reality. Uh, and this is something that I think we should work on both here and we are working on it here, but the um, you know the United States is central. It's it's extremely uh, uh, troubling and sad, though not at all uh, surprising, to read that the Biden administration seems to have finally reached the conclusion that um, there isn't going to be a, a ceasefire hostage deal uh, for the rest of the Biden the, the administration. Um, but this is not again. This is not a um, a, a done deal. This can be changed with enough uh, engagement and pressure and uh, willingness to hold, um, you know, the Israeli leadership accountable. The willingness to accept that the Netanyahu, as has been revealed in um, report after report by mainstream Israeli media, has been uh, uh, foot dragging, has been sabotaging the possibility of a hostage swap. So I think this is something that should still be high on our agenda and there needs to be work to try and change this current uh, dynamic where the the any conversation about the hostage deal has just been frozen now and um, so this is the, this is kind of speaking to this current moment and uh, maybe if you if you'd like i could move on to talk about the specifics of the report yeah that would be great 
So I think maybe I'll start with um, the bottom line of this report that Bisselem issued recently. Um, the conclusion that we reached was that since October 7th, uh, Israel has turned the, um, the Israeli uh, prison system that in, in, and it's the part of it that holds Palestinians into a network of torture camps. And this is, sounds like a very provocative um, statement. Um, the name of the report even, Welcome to Hell, comes from actually uh, one of the testimonies that we took for this report. Um, but we think this uh, quite uh, shocking title, this quite shocking name for uh, a report and the conclusion that we've reached represents the reality on the ground. Because what has happened uh, since uh, October 7th in the, the prison system, in the way Palestinian prisoners are treated, is um, both absolutely um, shocking and, and um, quite unprecedented, but also something that is systematically uh, pursued and that must be addressed internationally because we do not see it being addressed internally. Um, and I'm, I would like to, or later on, I'd, I'd post uh, parts of our uh, post, post parts of the report and the material we've done. Um, we've produced uh, videos, we produced, etc. Uh, in the um, in the chat feature here, so that people can watch it and read it for themselves. Because I think it's really crucial that we inform ourselves over these issues. But I think the bottom line, from the perspective of Bezalem, is that. In, under or you know, you know inspired by the uh, racist uh, positions of Minister Benvir and also by the real the terrible uh, uh, the dehumanization that has been of Palestinians that has been sweeping Israeli society. What we've seen since October seventh is is that across the board, uh, Palestinian. In Palestinians from all over our region, so from the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Israel, and clearly Gaza, have who have been arrested and spent uh, any time in Israeli detention, experienced the kind of treatment that amounts in many cases to actual, literal torture and certainly to abuse. Um, th this is this includes actual physical violence that has been used extensively throughout the system. It includes a, a psychological violence and emotional pressure and, and, and um, intimidation, humiliation. It includes horrific um, conditions, living conditions that have been deliberately created by the Israeli prison system. And it also includes things like the denial of uh, medical treatment and also something that for me is probably the most difficult to, to deal with, the denial of food, the actual starvation of Palestinian prisoners. Um, this is the bottom line of the report. And I think the most important conclusion that we have reached is that this is not some sort of rogue element operating from within the Israeli prison system. It's things that are happening across the board, to many Palestinians or to, to, to all Palestinian prisoners um, who have been in detention after October 7th. And it doesn't only happen in one or two uh, places. Like there's been a conversation publicly about Sdeteman. I think people have been aware of this uh, this detention facility. But Betselem's report is actually about pretty much all other detention centers. Um, and we have heard from Palestinians um, who were in all of these other detention centers throughout the entire period, um, very similar accounts. And this is, you know, as the bottom line, this has led us to the clear conclusion that none of this is coincidental or specific to any specific center. It's a policy decision. It's been implemented by, uh, by the leadership of the Israeli prison service, as, an, as, as I said earlier, inspired essentially by Bentville. Um, I, I would be really happy to answer questions about the report and, and hear what people are concerned with or are interested in. Um, and I don't know if you, how you'd want to 
coordinators, maybe you'd want to open up or ask a few uh, questions from, from the public. And, or I can go on and explain a little bit about the methodology that we used for this report. So I think um, I'm going to make a broad assumption. I apologize to folks who are who are listening um, if this is wrong, but I think a lot of our audience may not have actually read the report. So I really appreciate you giving that overview. Um, maybe you could, could you just give a little more detail as to what kinds of things you've been witnessing? Um, and, and then also, yeah, the methodology in which you guys have um, been able to to get these accounts, because I think that's also a very interesting process that you've you've been going through. Yeah. So first of all, maybe I will use this opportunity to start posting uh, in the chat feature. Um, and I think actually, I'm just going to give me a second in order to. Oh, I think I'm not able to actually host it. Actually, post um, every to all of the participants, but you could probably do it. So if you don't mind sharing, this is the link to the to the basic um, um, kind of um, executive summary of the report on the Telem's website. And the, and it leads to a page, a landing page, which also, it also includes a lot of testimonies. And this is kind of where we started the work on this report. So since October 7th, um, we, we and many other bodies, and when I say bodies, I mean human rights organizations, media uh, outlets, um, activists, lawyers representing Palestinians in Israeli courts, have, have been receiving uh, ongoing reports about a vast deterioration in the treatment of prisoners and detainees in the Israeli system. And uh, B'Tselem has been... Uh, working for several several months in the in the run up to the publication of this report on gathering testimonies and because this is our essential one of our main fortes uh, we have a network of excellent field researchers who are able to locate Palestinians uh, who are witnesses or victims of human rights violations and take testimonies from them in very carefully controlled uh, situations where they can really delve into the stories. And those testimonies began to flow into um, to our office, and then they were obviously cross-referenced and, and, and really uh, uh, kind of verified by um, other staffers, uh, the office staffers. And we began to understand the scope and the, you know, the scale of this policy and of this, um, this reality that has emerged Post October seventh, and that's when we decided to really focus this as a research report, and we guided our uh, field researchers to um, to collect testimonies from as wide a variety of people as possible. And I want to clarify one important thing, and this is something that we keep hearing in Israel's media that you know Palestinian prisoners, and this this uh, sentiment echoes the sentiment expressed often in Israel's media about Gazans as a whole. Well, you know, all of these Palestinians are Hamas, they're Nukba, they're, you know, they're Palestinian terrorists. Now, the point is, in a way, that everyone we spoke to were people who have been released in the period who were, uh, post October 7th. Some of them were arrested after October 7th, be it in Gaza or the West Bank, and then subsequently released, and our field researchers managed to speak to them, and others were Palestinians who were serving sentences and that were released then following uh, October seventh. But they could um, they could speak to the changing conditions um, in the Israeli prison service post the the uh, the start of the war in Gaza, and this also uh, indicates that none of the people we spoke to were actually involved in any way in committing, you know. The, the absolute uh, you know, horrific war crimes uh, by Hamas and other armed groups against Israeli uh, communities on October 7th. Uh, most of them actually have not been charged, right? Some of them were, were arrested and released without charge. Others were administrative detainees who have never been charged. Uh, as I'll, set, I'll say as an aside now, that now a very large number, I heard talk of, for example, four. 40% of Palestinian uh, detainees are administrative detainees now. So out of the about 10,000 Palestinian detainees in Israeli custody these days, a vast number have never been charged and will never actually be, be uh, 
we have a trial. Um, so clearly those pa uh, Palestinians who um, participated in uh, in Hamas's attack, or Hamas and other armed groups' attack on Israelis should be held accountable. That is absolutely clear. But claiming that all of these prisoners are actually involved in this is not uh, correct. However, the, the treatment that these Palestinian prisoners experienced was very similar across the board. And this, uh, as I said earlier, is one of the main reasons that led us to conclude that this is a matter of policy rather than a specific um, decision in within a specific prison or a specific period. So that's one of the reasons. The second reasons, uh, reason that has led us to this conclusion is that some of the uh, policies were actually stated openly by Israel. Uh, the fact, for example, that Palestinians now have a much reduced, um, vastly reduced uh, capacity, uh, food uh, allowance is public. None of this was hidden. Uh, in fact, Minister Ben Gvir, you know, kind of uh, boasted this. Um, the fact that Palestinians have had all of their personal possessions confiscated, even though none, they were allowed to hold them beforehand. The fact that there have never, there have not been any, um, you know, family visits from Gaza, and uh, and, uh, and also I think the fact that um, Palestinians can't actually even buy, uh, purchase any sort of supplementary food. These are not secrets. Um, there's also been many, many kind of stories in Israeli media and all sorts of other reports uh, talking about this ter how like how hardcore um, is the treatment of Palestinian prisoners. So a lot of this is just plainly obvious. And when we take testimonies, certainly you know our field researchers will meet with people, will take, will discuss what they went through. And um, one of the interesting things was that people who talked about the treatment in particular uh, in prisons and detention centers um, throughout this period could have been from Hebron, they could have been from East Jerusalem, they could have been from Gaza. Some were arrested and even returned to Gaza. And in fact, there were also several Palestinian citizens of Israel who had been arrested after October 7th and experienced this similar, uh, similar treatment. So you really can see how um, the prison service applied these policies uh, very broadly. And this, I think, really is just an excellent example of the broader discussion that we're trying to also generate within Israeli society of, uh, about the Israeli prison system generally as a method, as part of the system of control that Israel has over Palestinians. So this is the methodology. And then we also um, did as much as we could to cross-reference. Like on some issues, we have several testimonies. On some cases, we have um, a, a, a also a lot of uh, material like uh, medical uh, records, or in some cases, there are some uh, legal documents. So uh, all of this led us or served us in, in the authoring of the report and in terms of the um, the actual testimonies we really tried to make them available in their entirety we also sent some colleagues to do video interviews with um, with some of the witnesses and all of this as i said is available online and we really encourage people to watch and read this because one when you um you know, when you when you hear about the general trends or the general policies in the in the report this is terrible enough it's it's um, shameful um, enough but when you see the faces of the people who are mistreated and you hear their stories and you actually um, can can understand what they went through that I think really reflects much much more strongly uh, how extreme the situation is right now and this is something you'll hear a lot from many Palestinians, uh, who were arrested or detained in the in the past year or so that and a lot of them are experienced and have been to prison before to an Israeli prison but they said they never experienced anything like what they've felt after uh, October 7th um yeah so maybe let's continue the the conversation sorry yeah those testimonies are very powerful I confess I did not make it through all of them they were pretty tough 
um, to get there. So I, I really commend all of you for gathering them, putting them together. Um, it's it's not easy, but yes, everyone, if you have not had a moment to check it out, it's worth um, looking through. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I have a couple questions for you. Um, first off, you mentioned, I'm going to take a step back, I guess. And you, you mentioned some of the, the vast numbers of administrative detainees who've not been charged. Um, and I think for folks who are, who are listening to this and I, I, it might be worth talking a little bit about their legal recourse or what that looks like. Like how, how long can people be held without being charged? What, how do they, mm -hmm. you know, challenge yeah. this? How do they get released? Can you, can you talk a bit about it? Yeah. So yeah, this is another, another really terrible aspect of, of a very, very terrible policy. Administrative detention is basically taking a person and putting them behind bars, locking them up without any trial in which they can actually defend themselves against some sort of accusation or some sort of actual, I should, I should explain it, some sort of indictment. Um, it's, it's been uh, used extensively by Israel vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, it's used extremely rarely also against Israeli uh, far-right activists, like very settlers who are suspected of uh, extreme violence. But these are like a handful, literally a handful of cases every, in every any given moment. Whereas um, with Palestinians, Israel has been using this um, tool for very, very extensively. Although now, of course, the the the, the numbers have just you know shot uh, you know off the chart. Basically, what happens is that there's a recommendation by the Israeli security agency, the Shabak, to the the military uh, commander, and they will issue uh, an administrative detention order against someone with a very laconic statement like we issue this because this person is a suspected Hamas or Islamic Jihad in terrorist essentially endangering the security of the area that's the information they'll receive and then there's like a process through which they can it's not really an appeal because it isn't an actual adversarial process where you can you see what you're charged with you can uh, you know you can bring witnesses and question them and have a cross examination um, Everything is done on the basis of secret evidence and in cameras. So many of the, much of the process uh, isn't even um, open to the to the lawyer representing the detainee. Um, and the, this administrative detention order can last up to six months, and then it can be renewed. So it can be indefinitely renewed. This, um, you know, it's it's so obviously such a huge draconian violation of the right to due process that even though administrative detention isn't totally prohibited internationally um, under international law, because it's so it's so egregious, it is meant to be used only in extremely rare conditions as a very very last resort, as a deterrent. Uh, no, uh, sorry, not a deterrent, as a as a sort of a preemptive. Um, a, a process when there isn't any other option. Um, Israel has taken this very narrow allowance, as it were, that international law provides, and just expanded it um, to, to suit um, almost any needs in terms of arresting and, and detaining Palestinians from the West Bank. When it comes to Gaza, there's a slightly different legal framework, but it's pretty much similar to the administrative detainee, which is the illegal combatants law. And that is another, again, so administrative detention is um, um, grounded in the Israeli military legislation and in the uh, emergency regulations. And um, the uh, arrest or the administrative detention in some ways, or the detention without trial of Gazans in Israeli prisons after the uh, the 2005 um, a, a unilateral a, a withdrawal is grounded in what is called um, the unlawful combatants law. But a lot of it is very similar in essence. I don't want to go into all of the into the details, but it's about detaining people without trial for a prolonged period. And this is what we're seeing now in the West Bank. Um, 
And again, I'm not saying that this didn't happen in the past, but post October 7th, it just feel, it doesn't seems like, or it doesn't seem like it, this is the reality. Um, there is such a, a lack of any sort of either public debate or internal criticism or external criticism or any sort of monitoring of the system uh, that the system has expanded its its um, reach, its its, uh, its violations uh, in this sense, in in, in such a um, really just uh, as I said, I'm, I'm using this term uh, quite a lot as an unprecedented way in the Israeli military courts. Even in the past, we've been extremely critical of these courts. We view them as a tool of the Israeli occupation regime, but and, and of Israeli apartheid, which is how B'Tselem refers to the reality in our region. But since October 7th, uh, the, you know, the floodgates have really opened in terms of all of these um, just like temporary and being extended kind of indefinitely uh, relaxations of all of the restrictions that are meant to provide some sort of protection and in this process for Palestinian uh, prisoners. And this is uh, the result, is, is a vast number of people who are detained without trial. It could be indefinitely because often once one uh, administrative detention order expires, it's renewed the day that you leave the prison, your de detention, uh, your um, administrative detention um, is renewed. And, you know, as, as a, I think as people who are committed to judicial review, to the rule of law, to some me measure of democracy, Israel claims it is, um, this is simply unacceptable. Agreed. Um... And I want to talk a bit more. You mentioned, you know, it can be renewed when people leave and things like that. And that gets me into my next question, which was, it, it takes a lot of courage, I think, for people who've gone through these abuses and then to testify um, and give witness to what they experience. How are, how are people protected? Um, you know, especially with the threat of being, you know, returned to administrative detention what what is that like how, how are you guys managing that so this is a very good question i don't think i have the perfect answer because um one of the things that betselem tells uh, our witnesses and we, it's not we're not um like a legal support organization so we're not representing these people we're not their lawyers we take testimonies not affidavits um and we we try to be clear to testifiers and to witnesses that um, even though we will do all we can to try and help them in the case in case there are reprisals we're not be going when we're clear that we're not going to be able to really protect them from these this type of uh, action if the Israeli authorities decide to um, to punish them for being giving their testimonies in some cases we publish um, Anonymous testimonies after we, we have the names and we know the, the people that we decide to withhold their their names and their uh, their details. Um, and we also say very clearly that one of the to to, to people who give us testimonies that um, that we will try and also um, get their stories told, get their uh, accounts publicized about what they had to deal with. This is, um, I think, still to this day, and even though our situation really is deteriorating in our in our um, in all of on all of these issues, media exposure and international uh, and Israeli media exposure is really essential uh, and can be a component, at least, of exposing and talking about uh, these wrongs. Uh, and also, I think. The, um, from my experience, at least, Palestinians who have been uh, through uh, Israeli human rights violations very often want to tell their stories and often, more often than not, want to tell their stories to, to Israelis as well. This is something I've, I've been doing this work for almost 20 years and 
This is something that I've seen again and again. People who want Israelis to understand what was done to them, even though Israel perpetrated these uh, violations against them. Uh, Palestinians who, for example, often, um, I mean, I can give the example of uh, administrative detention, uh, are saying again and again, if you have evidence that my son, my, my, you know, my loved one perpetrated crime, uh, an offense, a terror offense, try them. Uh, but the fact that people are going to, to um, you know, going behind bars without a trial uh, really offends like this basic sense of justice that many Palestinians have. And I think many of us have, regardless of our, uh, you know, of our background. And this is something that people want uh, talked about. Um, I think we have had a few cases where people didn't want to give testimonies because they were in a situation that felt to them or or uh, was was certainly it wasn't just a feeling was a conclusion that they had reached that giving a testimony would risk them in ways that they were not willing to, to take um but overall there are enough people who are willing to tell their stories who want to tell their stories and as i said uh, it's not we never take it for granted that palestinians will want to tell their stories to an Israeli human rights organization, and they know that B'Tselem is an Israeli organization. Um, but we, but as I said, from my vast experience, not just on these issues, but on other issues as well, Palestinians do want their stories uh, heard by Israelis. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk, shift a little bit to um, some of the reception this report has received. Um, both within Israel, I think maybe we'd start there. Um, obviously, you mentioned Sid Taman and kind of the, the the far right's response to to what's been going on. But if you could, you know, dig into how that's been received overall, and then of course um, international outcry as well. Yeah, I think that it's it's a really difficult and i think also painful thing for all of us to to talk about the, this past year has just been um you know an exercise in just br brutality and and seeing the suffering and the pain of people and um how this pain and this trauma has been really uh, abused i think um by our government to 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 do two things one is just to exert revenge on Palestinians. But the second thing, again, this is very broad, it's a very general uh, in assessment. The second thing is also that Israelis' trauma and our shock and horror of what has happened in, in to us on October 7th, what, what Hamas did to us, um, has also been used to promote a political uh, agenda uh, and a political project that has been in existence long before uh, October 7th. Um, I'll give two examples. One is related to, to this and the other is a different one. In the West Bank, for example, the government has been using, um, um, again, this like everything, everything that, is, uh, that Israelis feel, the shock, the horror, the, the um, outrage, the, the fear, uh, in order to promote uh, the takeover of land by Israeli settlers and the forcible transfer of Palestinian communities. That's just one example. When it comes to the Israeli uh, prison system, so some of the policies that we've seen implemented uh, by or inspired by Benfield post October 7th are an, ext an extension or um, a massive increase of policies that were already in existence before, like the the um, goal that the that Ben Gvir had of um, making the conditions of Palestinian prisoners worse, making this into an issue for him and his um, his voters. It's a very popular, I think, um, move for him. You know the the uh, uh, the fact that Palestinians were not allowed to bake their own bread, for example, and many other of these like, kind of like small. Uh, not small, maybe large changes for them, but uh, petty um, changes uh, were in place before October 7th. So it's not something new, but the policy 
trying to remove Palestinians from their land through settler violence or um, focusing a lot of effort into this, you know, uh, making um, changes to the conditions of Palestinian detainees um, were in existence before. And October 7th was very useful for this. And the reason I'm mentioning it in, in this context of the response uh, to the report is because I think they they operate on a similar level or on a similar plane with how a lot of Israelis respond to uh, not just Excellence report by the way but to many other exposures of the conditions in in of the you know detainees uh, with just a kind of a very callous lack of interest or um, in some cases, even uh, just um, you know, just a, a reflection that they don't really care that you know after October seventh and after Hamas did, it just doesn't matter. We don't we don't care about how they're treated. It's it's um, I've a lot of people I've read or heard in different contexts, not necessarily in our reports context were saying things like, you know, I've run out of empathy, or that my main empathy is for Israelis who suffered uh, and for the hostages, etc. Um, but I don't want to also tar the entire Israeli public with the same brush, because we have seen also a really, really clear expressions of shock, of outrage, of um, an understanding of how uh, damaging and brutal and um, uh, just uh, uh, kind of like a uh, long-lasting uh, uh, this report or the, this this reality that uh, is expressed in our report is by many Israelis. I think a lot of Israelis expressed um, again. I'm, I'm also paraphrasing a lot of comments that I've heard and read and received. Uh, are expressing this uh, this idea that regardless of what people have done and what these Palestinians have done or suspected of uh, having done, if they are guilty of crimes or of of um, you know actions uh, uh, against Israelis or of terror, of attacks, or or violence, they should be held accountable and they should be uh, uh, punished. For their actions, but this this kind of behavior and conduct is um, far is is just outside of what is acceptable in in this kind of in in a in a law you know in a in a basically law abiding society, right? So this perspective, I think, it was was heard also by voices in Israeli society that are not particularly uh, supportive of B'Tselem. But I think there is a component within the Israeli center that understands that um, the powers that have been unleashed by, not just by Ben Gvir, but also by others in the government in, in, and in Israel, and also, I should say, by parts of the opposition, this kind of, these kind of urges uh, and these kinds of uh, vicious um, you know, kind of like a, a, a violent a, a, a practices and policies are something that is damaging, not just for the Palestinians who have been a, suffering as a result of this Palestinian detainees, but also to this core, this essential a, moral standing that Israelis, those Israelis would like to think a, that they're still promoting. And I, I don't know if I managed to, to clarify this, but I've seen, I'm trying to kind of like meld uh, together a lot of things I've read about this. Um, I also think that the fact that in the reports within Israeli um, media of these uh, violations, the main people interviewed were actually Palestinian citizens of Israel who were arrested after October 7th and then released without charge, right? Some of them were arrested for offenses that are like freedom of speech offenses, yet subjected to such vicious and violent treatment. This was also quite a shocking thing for a lot of Israelis. They gave testimonies in Hebrew. They, they are, a couple of them are lawyers. So this was also a very 
I think, a moving part of this. And then I, sh I should also say that um, official Israel currently, and, and by this I also would, would probably mention, uh, include not just the Ben Gvirs of Israel, but also the Israeli, um, you know, the system, the, the, mil, mil, the, the Israeli uh, Attorney General and, and the people responsible for responding, for example, to high court petitions on the condition of detainee, Palestinian detainees uh, have not been particularly shocked by this and seem to be, um, unfortunately, very uh, uh, willingly uh, or maybe unwillingly, but uh, co-opted into this system. It's not just the Ben Gvirs who are beating people up. It's legal advisors who are approving it. It's, it's uh, uh, higher ups in the Israeli prison service who are who are allowing this to happen. Um, and then I think internationally, I sh the, the response has been very um, different in the sense that there was like a lot of media coverage of this report, probably far more than within Israel. I think in Israel, the majority of people exposed to the report were primarily people who will generally be kind of like interested in this issue rather than the broader public, whereas internationally, I think this um, led to wider coverage. And I also think that the fact that this report was coincidentally not, uh, obviously we couldn't know this was the case, but happened to be released just after such a uh, really um, in incredible uh, scenes like we saw in Sdeteman and in Betlid. I don't know if people are familiar with what happened when, when a mob of far-right activists uh, invaded a military base and also then a military detention center, military center in order to uh, try and release soldiers who were uh, uh, detained sus suspected of terrible mistreatment of a, a suspect, a Hamas suspect, in that uh, um, led, I, I do think that led to really massive public outrage inside Israel, and that you know our report was uh, came out pretty much similar during similar time. And I think also it kind of contributed to this. So that's um, you know taking hundreds of comments and responses and articles and trying to blend them into a, sh a relatively short response. I think you did a wonderful job. Um, I do have some follow-ups from folks in the chat about it, though. Um, you know, they're asking if you, B'Tselem, are being facing any reprisals as well. Um, they mention Haggai speaking um, at the CJ and you, Yuli Novak speaking at the Security Council and being scorned and threatened by the government. Um, and this report um, elicited more of the same. What's the response been there? Um I have a theory, and this is, I, it's not B'Tselem, it's my personal uh, assessment, that Israeli politicians will attack us when it suits them politically and electorally, right? It's not, you don't have to be a genius, you know, kind of an analyst to reach this theory. But the reason I'm mentioning it right now is that I think Ben Gvir, for example, at the moment has his own, you know, very, very effective campaign. I have to say, again, this is my personal opinion. I think that many Israelis who tend to think of him in a quite a dismissive way as a like a very failed minister uh, are wrong. He managed to obtain his own objectives. He armed the Israeli far right by with 160,000 firearms over the past year. Uh, he's managed to co-opt and and, uh, and and corrupt both the Israeli police and the Israeli prison system very quickly, although they obviously have been willing accomplices, uh, but he didn't really bother much with the B'Tselem, I don't think. Uh, and I think it's because we just he just has bigger fish to fry at the moment. But um, I'm not discounting other forms of criticism by um, central Israeli politicians. And uh, the two uh, or the three examples that happened recently are both Israeli, uh, Danny Danone, Israel's uh, ambassador to the UN, uh, and two uh, Likud members of Knesset. Uh, one is um, is deputy speaker of parliament who, who you know, uh, lashed out at B'Tselem and at Yuli Novak, our, our CEO, for speaking at the Security Council, uh, called for outrageous things like uh, being uh, prosecuting her uh, for supporting the enemy during times of war, which is if people don't know, 
it carries, it's an offense that carries a, se a death sentence or life imprisonment, no less, um, or calling for her in, for her uh, citizenship to be revoked. The reason I'm mentioning it is that even though within Israel, these uh, members of the parliament are viewed with ridicule, they are central uh, politicians in the ruling party. And this uh, should just, you know, uh, be a really, a really real eye opener for how much uh, official reprisals and how much um, pressure there is now inside Israel um, against anyone who speaks out. It's not just about human rights defenders. It's anyone who opens their mouth um, and, and strays from the party line. And you can see it again and again. And this is something that is that should actually be constantly um, opposed by the international community. I, I, unfortunately, internally, we don't have enough power and we need you. So you people watching this webinar to really engage on this. But I have to also say that for, for B'Tselem and I think for all of us in, the, in our human rights um, uh, family, our community in Israel, it's always much more important to remember that the reason we are attacked is because we're exposing the violation of the rights of Palestinians. We're talking about this. So the way, the most important thing is to talk about these violations, to talk about Israeli apartheid and what it's doing, to talk about the war. Um, and it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be, you know, kind of, of you know, overly uh, dismissive or brave or, or 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 shirk off the risks to Israeli human rights defenders because these risks exist. But I think we also have to remember that we're not the most important part of the story. The 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 risk to Palestinians is higher. Um, so I think it is important, though. Having said all that, that the U.S. administration engages on this with Israeli policymakers, that the international community engages, that they, you know, that it's it's clarified to Israelis that this is totally unacceptable, that it's unacceptable to hound human rights defenders for saying, um, speaking the truth. Um, yeah, and, and uh, we need your help, obviously, on these issues. Thank you. Um, speaking of, you know, the most vulnerable here, um, we have a question in the chat. The issue of you know, children in detention has been something that, um, you know, has been on the minds of Congress now for many, many years. Um, and, you know, there's been a bill that's been introduced basically every, um, you know, two years with each new Congress about that. Um, but here's the, I'll just get into the question without the context here. Um, Francesca Albanese cites an average of 700 children in administrative detention um, about a year ago. How has that changed? And how has the treatment of children changed in the past year? Have you noticed any any shifts now um, as everything seems to have devolved further? So everything has deteriorated. Also, the conditions of, of children have deteriorated in terms, for example, of uh, visits. They don't they don't get visits either in military or in detention, uh, family visits, and as far as I understand it, not even phone calls. Um, I don't know the exact figures at the moment for children, uh, as in like people under 18 in administrative detention, or in, uh, uh, but I don't think uh, the number of 700 is, um, is, um, uh, is an accurate number of administrative detainees. Right, the the number of uh, minors, children who have been administered detainees, is much lower. is is, is a handful, um, but the adults who are administrative detainees are, you know, detained in these numbers. Uh, but even if it's not administrative detention, the way Palestinian uh, minors are treated in Israel's military court system. Uh, B'Tselem has actually done quite a lot of work on this, uh, not in like the last five or six years, but uh, but we have done a lot of work on this in the past and the system hasn't essentially changed. There are, um, I think, clear uh, examples of the system being uh, kind of like a railroading system for Palestinian children suspected of offenses in the sense that if a child is uh, and anyone, you know, a, a minor, anyone under 18 is suspected 
by Israel of any sort of uh, public order or, or you know, offense. And the main offense for Palestinian children is still stone throwing. Um, that's according to statistics that have been available in recent years. Um, then the, the way the system treats them is through a process whereby they're often arrested. Still, it can happen at night uh, from their beds interrogated in ways that would not be considered legal if they were Israeli children, and then often forced it into confessions that then lead to their remand on custody and then eventually to a plea bargain. And virtually all cases in the military courts are settled by a plea bargain because of this pressure, because, um, and you know, we can go into it in depth, but or you can read the B'Tselem report on this, on minors in detention. Um, and this means that there is no real like trial, an evidentiary trial where you really know exactly, you can defend yourself, you have some sort of capacity to defend yourself, doesn't really exist. So a plea bargain is usually the case, is what happens. Now, the Israeli system generally has a lot of plea bargains, but the military court system has a far higher uh, percentage. And oft, you know, this is, you know, again, in, in total contrast with the Israeli system, a, um, a custodial sentence is usually what these children will get. Since October 7th, everything has gone more extreme in the military uh, court system. The treatment of adults, the treatment of, uh, of children, and it really is um, something also that is uh, sanctioned, it's allowed by the, the court, um, you know, the actual court, the, the, the um, what uh, the chief uh, military uh, j justice, I'm not sure the, the exact title. So it's not, again, it's not like some sort of rogue uh, or or co coincidental decision. It's a systematic violation of rights. And maybe I should also say, you know, in this context that since October 7th in the West Bank as well, I'm not, you know, the, the number of Palestinian children who had been killed in Gaza is simply unfathomable. Um, but also in the West Bank since October 7th, Palestinian children have, uh, have been killed in record shocking numbers. And a very large part of these cases were children who were shot by so primarily by soldiers or other Israeli forces. Uh, and in at least half of these cases that Bethlehem documented, uh, there was no justification for the use of lethal force under those circumstances, right? The, the situations could have been uh, dealt with um, without using le lethal force. One of these cases is actually a case we'll be publishing in the next uh, couple of days, or it may even be on our website later tonight, of a 12-year-old Palestinian who was shot while running away from soldiers in the, the town of Elbire, um, whose name is uh, Muhammad de Hushia, and we have a video showing this uh, this uh, in this case. I mean, it's, it's just one of many where video shows clearly he was shot while he was running away. Uh, the army accused him of participating in stone throwing. The video show, shows him show, uh, running away. But tell him his position is that it's uh, irrelevant because a 12 year old should not be shot. And, and you can just see him running away, uh, and he was clearly, at the time of shooting, not posing any sort of risk. So uh, again, I, I expect this um, this story to be on our website, this this case to be on our website in the next few days, and, and really welcome uh, people viewing it. Thank you. That's absolutely horrifying, um, and we really appreciate the work you've been doing. Um, I want to close on, uh, not, not necessarily an optimistic note, but may maybe, um, I have a couple questions from folks who, who want to know what can be done to, to kind of walk this back and, and reform, um, the way Palestinians are treated in the prison system and also how Americans can assist in that. Um, so in B'Tselem's uh, report, we primarily concluded that we are calling on the international community and on all uh, you know, relevant states and all other bodies, including, for example, the International Criminal Court, to take action to end this reality. Um, 
this isn't because it's a it's a policy and because this policy is quite popular i think and is definitely supported by the government we don't see an internal process suddenly that will lead to to a change um i do think that we have to remember that in some cases recently the international the israeli high court has made some uh, pronouncements recently for example only a few days ago the um, the um, association for civil rights in israel acri's high court petition on sedetman was accepted by the high court justices i'm not a legal i'm not a lawyer or legal advisor but some analysts think that the risk of international criminal accountability of israeli policy makers has actually caused the israeli um high court to be more um, assertive in how it's dealing with this but still we would argue that the the broad story it hasn't been dealt with by the high court so for example the the um, denial of food the the deliberately uh, terrible uh, conditions hygienic conditions uh, living conditions those things uh, there have been high court petitions on these issues uh, but they haven't led to any sort of um, decisions by the court there has been um uh, some anecdotal evidence uh, and this is something that is very difficult obviously to prove over time that some of the media coverage of this issue has led to some pressure on the israeli authorities uh, but this remains to be seen we will have to wait and see and you know have to interview uh, palestinians who have been released in recent months in order to see whether something's changed internally but the problem is i think that and this is something we have to to admit that within israeli society i think the thing the changes the really terrible um you know brutalizing also of israeli society and the the dehumanization process that we have gone through vis-a-vis -vis palestinians it, which allowed this uh, reality to to emerge is also not really kind of conducive to any sort of positive change within with, to kind of address this issue so i'm not sure i have a lot of positive uh, optimistic uh, messages but i think we we certainly need to to continue to do this and i think the fact that not just the telemann i really want to be clear on this issue uh, of of the treatment of the uh, palestinians in the israeli prison system and several other organizations have been doing incredible work uh, and journalists have been exposing this and people have been talking about this issue so it's it's really a, a collective effort i think on behalf of israel's human rights community um you know it's not a popular issue to deal with the rights of palestinians some of whom are accused some of whom have actually perpetrated uh, in, in crimes under you know against israelis um this but this is i think such a such an important issue if you're thinking about this like essence of human rights work and that's why we are going to continue to do it regardless of how uh, unpopular and how difficult it, it makes you know or how difficult it makes our position within our society well thank you it is it is important work and, and we're very very grateful for your partnership um I think I have to close now, although there's obviously much more to talk about. But thank you, um, Sari. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you to everyone in the audience um, for your very thoughtful questions. We will um, be posting this on our website. You can review the recordings um, there in maybe a day or so. Thank you, and have I appreciate a it. And uh, please follow us on all the relevant social media and our website, and we'll be. Thank you. And our hearts are you. with you and everyone else um, during this very, very tense moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.